Well, I am rather busy. Uh, now he's going to move like right along to McGregor. That's his whole life. You know. So, Richard, as someone native to the wonderful state of New Jersey, do you think that the Jersey Devil was an appropriate and an accurate representation of your home state? It was. So you have wild I women running around. I recognize it. Yes, we call them Jersey girls, but you know, it, it's it's definitely the way. Um, they definitely have that kind of big hair going on. Uh, I don't know what accent. It seemed like everybody was trying to do a Jersey accent, except there, you know. They weren't agreeing on what a Jersey accent was. Well, I mean, <laughs> to be fair, most of the actors are from Canada. Yeah, that's true. So they don't really know what New Jersey is. Yeah. So, you know, we talked last week during Squeeze, which was kind of the first Monster of the Week episode. Um, episodes one, two, and four have been all about the alien stuff. And I didn't really like Squeeze. A lot of it was because... I didn't like the monster. I thought Eugene Toombs was just – it didn't really gel together as a concept. Now, this week in both, we have another Monster of the Week storyline, and I really liked these two episodes. I thought the monster was more interesting. I found the plots more cohesive, and both of them were kind of about something. You know, Eugene Toombs isn't about anything, doesn't really right. provide any deeper meaning to this. And, for example, while – um uh, while the Beast Woman in Jersey Devil isn't exactly about the plight of the homeless, certainly they're juxtaposing those things together, and you know, st- and certainly, and the next one is a very interest. It's using a supernatural story to tell a real world story about weapon su- sales. Yeah, I mean, I think that that you know, um, the X Files is certainly not the type of show, like for example, yeah. the original Star Trek, that is going to use science fiction means to, to criticize, you know, modern day America or anything like yeah. that. However, I do think that there are some, some deeper resonances there that, that, that do get overlooked a lot of the time, yeah. especially with an episode like the Jersey devil, where interestingly enough, I think that these two episodes, Jersey devil in particular, number one does have a lot to say about, um, interesting ideas about, about the homeless and about, also, uh, 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 you know, the, the character of the anthropologist, for example, talking about how sort of, you know, uh, different groups get marginalized and things like that. Yeah, and in general, humanity as a destructive environmental force. Again, if that's not the deepest theme ever, it's certainly a more resonant underpinning to put a what, – what is a science fiction thriller mystery – it, it 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 gives it makes it a deeper story. It's not just a you know silly. It's not a silly show. No, it's not a silly show. I think it takes itself seriously as seriously and... as it needs to take itself because it does at the end of the day want to entertain us. The thought of a missing link species and this beautiful beast lady running around killing people. I mean that that is campy in its own way, and yet it can have it. it I think it does a good job at times of having it both the camp with the more serious, you know, we've had a lot of fun, but there's nothing fun about homelessness and the way that we destroy the environment, for example. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, I want to talk about that stuff, but I I think the first thing that I want to talk about is kind of the show as a whole and how it's shaping up because I think the first, the first season in general, and especially I think the first half of the season you know, are are rough. They're certainly yeah. not. Um, they're not bad episodes. I think you can see glimmers of the brilliance that the show will get in later seasons. It does definitely become a a much more. I don't want to say I don't want to say beautiful show, but it definitely becomes a much more sort of thematically resonant show and and a very interesting show. Now, Whoa. also the thing that I noticed about the Jersey Devil and also Shadows is that. The Jersey Devil breaks up the team for mm. for a large part of it, which is something that the show has not done before. Yeah, and in Shadows, which you know we'll talk about in a few minutes, Mulder and Scully aren't, aren't the main re- characters. Right, they're not yeah. really part of the episode. They're that kind much. of a Greek chorus almost. It's and I don't know. I do kind of like that aspect of it that these are characters who can already they're being placed in a lot of different stories like. I, again, I can already see that, yes, it's going to get much better than this. The show would not be a classic if this were all that it was. But at the same time, and this may be a little odd to say, but this is a better show than TNG Season 1 was already. 
I think that most anything. Well, is. That, you know, that's fair. But I mean, even if it has a little to go to find its voice, it still feels like it's most of the way there, which is now, of course, TNG did have a lot more moving parts at the beginning, just in terms of who the main cast is. I mean, the only cast we get week to week on the X-Files is Mulder and Scully. And I mean, in a certain way, I think this is a harder show to do than, than TNG. And in mm. a certain way, it's an easier show to do. You know, and I don't know that we want to compare it too much, but I, I do think that, for example, it, it was to the show, it was to the X-Files credit that it had a, a strong, you know, creative leader in Chris Carter. Yeah. I think it was to the show's credit that it, it had very, very uh, strong performances by David Duchovny and Gillian yeah. Anderson. Now, you know, interestingly enough, Gillian Anderson is on the record as saying that, especially in um, in in the Jersey Devil and Shadow, she felt like she wasn't really sure about who she was playing, and she wasn't, really, yeah, you know. And you can definitely see that. I think that David Duchovny as Mulder is much more of a fully formed character, even in the pilot. I think he had yeah. a very strong idea of who this character was. But in Gillian, Gillian yeah. Anderson, not so much. But I do think that she is getting there i mean also the thing is like she was very very young and i i think i may have mentioned this when we talked about the pilot but you know fox was was concerned about casting her only because she was so young she was 25 yeah when the pilot was filmed i mean to a degree that actually does i i it's a happy accident that that does fit the characters this is a world Mulder has lived in for a while and while scully very quickly is acclimating herself this is all very new to her. She hasn't read all of the X Files yet. She doesn't, you know, necessarily know what all these things are signs of. She's starting to realize. I mean, uh, in the second episode, she's, you know, she's like, "All right, that was an X File, though, right?" Like, she knows where this is going. Um, yeah, and I mean, like in 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 later seasons, we will definitely have fun uh, talking about Scully's journey throughout the show. You know, one of the run. I don't think this is going to become as a surprise to you, but. You know, more often than not, Mulder is is the one that is portrayed as correct, and yeah. it, it does become sort. Of, it's a running joke, I think, in X Files fandom that that you know Scully is is giving these increasingly lame <laughs> explanations for things as she's seen all kinds of crazy shit of for course. like five years, and then she's still saying, "Well, I don't think it's aliens," you know, <laughs> stuff like that. But anyway, yeah, and again, so far the way they've handled it has been. She's willing to follow him, but she she is the one who's, again, making it very clear that it doesn't really matter what she personally believes because she's the one who's presenting this to other people. She needs to get a version of this story that will be acceptable to other people. And so really, yes, the fact that she's seen all this stuff for what will ultimately be 10 years is almost irrelevant because – nobody else has been there yeah and also i mean frankly too that that you know Mulder is just really fucking charismatic and yeah and, and he you know for example like for when when she goes to the college and takes you know Mulder to the college yeah to, to obviously to kind of talk him down a little bit and to say here's a man who has studied this you know he's going to yeah. convince you that that you're wrong and Mulder actually sort of convinces the professor that that this is possible well yeah at the end of the day he can't rule it out yet and as they as scientists they do know that uh, uh, again she is more concerned with uh scully is viewing this evidence from a guilty until proven innocent way and Mulder is an innocent until proven guilty or maybe the other way around i'm not quite uh i know what you mean yeah exactly he doesn't need the evidence you know and as long as long as he hasn't seen anything against it he thinks it's possible he ha- he is able to make that leap and he has convinced now was that anthropologist character by the way is he ever seen again because he's he's because he's said to be her professor and i liked him I feel like maybe yes, but I I can't say for sure. Yeah, I liked the little party that they gathered together with the park ranger. Like again, you know, they the this the Jersey Devil is more about they collect two allies and they go on this quest, and then the other uh, shadows is about this other is focusing on this woman with Mulder and Scully, kind of appearing to explain and investigate. Uh, right. Which I, I, I like again. Already, the show is using them in very different ways. Yeah, no, it absolutely is. I think that. I mean, well, let's talk about about um, uh, Scully's plot in, in the Jersey Devil. Yeah, because I do think it's interesting, and I think it's both a way to maybe um, 
placate the network a little bit and then yeah. also get rid of it because you know the the entire tension throughout really this episode on, on the part of Scully is you know does she want to you know we already know Mulder is consumed by this yeah. quest and we already know why he's consumed by the quest mm-hmm. because of his sister and he doesn't really have a life. He, he yeah. works. His, li- I, his life is his work, and his work is his life. Whereas Scully is, you know, she's a little bit younger than him. I don't think she's yeah. supposed to be significantly younger if she's 25. Again, about well, five or six years right. at most between them. She's late 20s. He's early 30s. But, you know, again, he's had a few more years, especially in the X-Files. But it's, she, you know, she's not 10 years younger than him, for example. Right. And I think, I you mean, know, if you look at if you look at what happened in, in Squeeze, for example, with the, the character uh, of the, you know, FBI agent yeah, yeah, yeah. to the academy together with and, and she looks at him as a careerist ladder yeah. climbing slime ball. But I don't know that she knows what she wants her career to look like. I don't know that she knows yeah. what she wants her her life to look like. And, you know, in the Jersey Devil, obviously, she is she is trying to have a life outside yeah. of her work. And what. At the end of the episode, what it really comes down to is that she's already buying into the quest that Mulder is on. And this is really, I think, yeah. Well, if, it, if it's not the end of her having a personal life, it's definitely her making a decision to focus on her work at this point and to really, really buy into and get attached to Mulder. Well, I think it was. A, it's very interesting that she's getting the – I thought the show was actually relatively subtle about it. Again, it's only – two three scenes in the entire episode but she is dealing with the general pressure that women deal with when they're in their late 20s and single which sure. when are you gonna get married and have a baby already um in the, the conversation with her sister first of all scully says you know i'm i may be good with the kids i may enjoy that's not her sister it's it's not that was her godson's birthday oh, party. Okay. I, I I assumed that meant anyway. So her her either way a f- close friend, somebody who is sister like to her, but um she may enjoy you know t- helping out at the occasional party. Of course, it's going to be chaotic, but you know she's exhausted at the end, but she's enjoying helping her friend. And uh, but she's saying you know I don't think this is what I want and. I love how the friend says, you went through FBI training. This should be easy. Well, no, she went to FBI training to become a good FBI agent. You know, there's... She can't shoot the kids. I knew uh, I knew a woman who was an... Um, I knew a woman who was an ATF agent, and she had a baby, and she was like, yeah, they're very different skill sets. You can't really transfer as much. Yes, maybe I know how to deal with the, you know, the stress of... Running through the streets of Newark, you know, chasing after drug dealers. But, you know, my kids are a different story. Also, um, apparently Richard knows an ATF agent. I, I've i known a lot of people over the years. I guess so. Um, I mean, the scene where they're on the date, she's bored out of her mind when he's talking about his kids and being an accountant. I mean, well, in a lot of ways... He's, that's boring. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, of course it is. She, he's not... He's her... In, in some ways, he's kind of her intellectual inferior. I mean, he's her... Um, she, as crazy as Mulder's ideas can be and is out there and weird and as much as being on Mulder's quest involves, the X-Files are a vocation more than a job in a lot of ways. And in many ways, attaching herself to the X-Files and the way she, I guess where the last week it, she's kind of falling into the X-Files, right? Because She's she's finding yes it, it it aligns a little more with her moral values but this was a, just a place she was put on randomly and if she makes the choice she can be out of it and be doing whatever job in the FBI that she wants. By the end of the Jersey Devil, she has made the choice because she's realizing this is a lot more interesting. This is actually yeah. <laughs> this is a better use of it, a, a, as a wife and a mother. Even if she is still working at the FBI, she's going to be divided and she's not going to be able to go as again as intellectually far as she's going to be able to with Mulder she's going to be see shit that nobody's ever seen before yeah no absolutely and I think that it it is definitely of a time because this is 1993 this is over 20 years ago at this point almost 25 years ago which is hard to believe but (laughs) it is it is the kind of thing where obviously yes I mean you know the feminist movement and, and getting women into the workforce was really about the fact that being a housewife is you know, a lot of women didn't find it fulfilling yeah. and a lot of women found it boring. 
And when the X Files started, you know, this was 1993. The 80s were sort of like you know the power decade. Women in in business suits with the shoulder pads and all this kind of stuff, and women were starting to really become part of uh, the workforce in in a very strong way. Although, still, you know, 25 years later, there are, there are issues surrounding that mm-hmm. still to this day, of course. But you know, you could have a char- you you couldn't have a character on on television, you know, in 1960 like Scully. But, you know, Scully is in that kind of like Mary Tyler Moore show vein more than she is in the uh, uh, Dick Van Dyke show Mary Tyler Moore. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like she is a very strong character. She Chris Carter, as I've talked about, obviously, you know, he f- wanted her to be Mulder's equal in every way. You know, she is a strong, yeah. capable person, not just a strong, capable woman, although she is a woman as well. And this episode is showing you that. But at the end of the day, she is making an explicit choice to not yeah. go down the, the the expected path. Well, like a, a lot of the first uh, second wave feminism, we, again focused on getting women into the workforce. But there was the concept of, in a way, having it all. Yes, you have your career, but you also really aren't going to be fulfilled as a woman if you don't have that husband and kid as well. And Scully is the person who's saying, "Now this is that's not where what's going to be fulfilling to me. That's not a dream of mine. That's not exactly where I want to go necessarily." And and it's also not to say that she couldn't change her mind down the road. Yeah, she is still young enough that she doesn't have. She can spend another five, even ten years, not worrying about it if she doesn't want to. Yeah, maybe ten years, but that's pushing it. Well, yeah, but she's not at that deadline yet. It's true. No, not yet. Well, let's talk about, I mean, the actual plot of the episode then, because we haven't talked a lot about that. Yeah. And I, I don't want to, like, go down a road of, of overselling the, the you know, cultural and sociological points that the yeah. episode is making. I don't think this is, like, a strong message episode about homelessness or anything, although it does it, say some things obliquely about yeah, it. Yeah, again, it's not, I, I, I don't think it's making a direct comparison with the uh, plight of the homeless with this beast person, but at the same time, one of the things they mention, they say a lot of times that the police chief is essentially doing the mayor from Jaws thing, right? Like, yeah. Uh, if if we let it known that there's this beast running around town, the tourism is going to suffer. How well do you think Atlantic City advertises its homeless problem? You know, it. it I'm the subtext of the episode. Is that – I mean because really a beast person is not what Atlantic City is hiding. It's hiding its homelessness. It's hiding its problems and it's trying to sweep these things under the rug in order to get profit. This is a be- – we, we hear a lot in this episode about humanity will grind the environment, any other species out just to prosper and in this episode we see humanity grinding itself down in order to prosper. Yeah, because I think yeah, that's all true, and I, I I think the the other half of that is that you know humanity can't always control everything. Yeah, in, in the same way that you know in a perfect world um, there would be no homeless people because yeah. they everyone would be given a home, but that's not the world we live in. And so with with Atlantic City, and I think it's interesting that it's Atlantic City as well. I mean, Chris Carter said I think that he chose Atlantic City because it does have this real problem. Yeah, and it, it, I mean it's pretty much decimated now yeah i I think atlantic city went bankrupt right and Mm. and there's basically no casinos left so even at even but yeah geologic geographically it's not as close to the pine barrens as the episode makes it seem but anyway yeah but still you know yeah that uh, it doesn't matter because the symbolic point is the more right right i mean you know the x-files is definitely the type of show that is going to sacrifice geographical consistency for for making a point or making a stronger episode which i'm fine with yeah you know i also i i agree with the episode as well that you know scully's incredulousness about the idea that there is you know an undiscovered primate wandering the woods of new jersey as as being unrealistic because of course the woods of new jersey are not really that extensive well the pine barrens are pretty dense and thickety you know but i mean we're not talking about montana like you know it's the kind of place where if you wander through you might you will likely get lost get lost and die eaten by a bear but you know would but if you pick a direction and walk in it you're eventually going to find some civilization I, you know, I mean, this is kind of the same problem I had with the Blair Witch Project, but anyway, exactly, that's, that's aside. It's, the, 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 well, the it, Blair Witch had magic happening for it, at least that was implied that there is a yeah. curse on the woods, and the, there is no such here. We just got to accept it. And in terms of, I mean, I'm I'm already seeing in a lot of ways the show is about mood and theme a lot more than plot at some point. So if if it doesn't exactly gel, I got its point. Yeah, I think so. And I also, you know, I I like the fact that that 
they break them up in this episode. Again yeah. Because it does give the Mulder stuff kind of an interesting energy because you yeah. can see how he could really go down a bad road of getting obsessed with this stuff and and him getting Scully assigned to the X-Files is they're they're already becoming a really integral yeah. not even a team they're they're just like they're together and she's the person he calls when he's in jail i mean that that's that that alone is saying where they're uh, and, and again, if if they don't, if she doesn't quite have the handle on the character, the two of them seem to have instant chemistry. Yeah. Now uh, that actually is something that. What is their working relationship? Um. What do you mean? Like, are they boss or something? No, like, no, no, no. Uh, I, I, I mean David Duchovny and Jillian. Jillian Anderson. Oh, I think they got along fine. Yeah. I mean, I never heard anything that they didn't get along or anything like that. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I was just, you know, curious if there was any behind-the-scenes drama because, again, the car- they act very well together. They do. Yeah, no, it's certainly not like Lauren Graham and Scott Patterson on Gilmore Girls who famously hated each other. Really? Yeah, you didn't know that? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they did. Or Fred and Ethel. Fred and Ethel. There you go. <laughs> yeah, no, I think they liked each other fine. I, you know, and I think that they do have a lot of... I mean. Part of what makes the X Files work in general is is David Duchovny and Gillian Anderson. Oh yeah, and and you know all of television works like this to some degree, where you you come back week after week because you you like these characters or you find them interesting or intriguing. And uh, but but that really works for the X Files to to a large degree because yeah. the the chemistry that those two actors have together. You know, you're rooting for them even in the worst episodes, and they make even the worst episodes of the show watchable. Yeah, and I would assume that the uh, again, not knowing exactly where the show goes, but having seen some late ones and knowing that the show does get, especially towards the later seasons, any any it, it'll tell a lot of very random and wacky stories. And there is a degree of, well, what hijinks are they going to get up to this week? What are they going to face? What monster from Urban Legends is going to be? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, 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 before we move on to Shadows, I, I think we would be remiss in, in not talking about the end of the episode because, of course, that is kind of the capper on the whole thing, which is that they, you know, the police murder yeah. the, the Jersey Devil. Now, uh, one one thing I thought was interesting is they normally when there's a trank guard dart and a lot of things, like, they'll instantly go down. They have the I, – I, I appreciated that they shoot her with the dart and she's still able to run away and – Unfortunately, that actually ends up leading to her death. If it was instant, they would have captured her safely. And it is definitely seen as I, – I like that they do end it – it does end extraordinary and ambiguously. This woman did, it seem, kill and eat a couple of people and was living at some point in the woods. But that's all they're able to really find out for sure. Genetically, it's nothing out of the ordinary. They don't really know exactly what happened. There's right. nothing that they can – Obviously, if this woman were captured alive, they would be able to get some answers. But uh, again, the greed of the police guy leads to them not really finding out. Well, yeah, because I mean, you know, in the same way that yeah. they really, um, you know, can find the homeless in Atlantic City to this one street yeah. or this one area of town, you know, they they don't care. They like the police chief, and it seems yeah. like the the episode is trying. I don't know that it's completely successful in making this point, but I think it is trying to make a point about how you know the government will will hide yeah. things that are stopping uh, you know the money from coming in. Yeah. and you know they let's you know they murder her because. They don't. It's the easiest way yeah. for them to solve the problem. Exactly, and, it's done. Yeah, it's done. They don't have to worry about it anymore. You okay. know, and and I also think that I mean, you know, the end of the episode. I mean, the X Files is famous for sort of its, yeah. its, its open ended endings, if I can use that kind of phrase. But it does that horror trope of the monster's still alive, and but again, in in at the end of this, it almost comes up as a life will find a way kind of a theme. I mean, you well. I, I don't know if this child is go if there are other you know beast people that it can still reproduce with, but the species isn't completely dead. Humanity still hasn't managed to, and, and, and I guess there is a weird hopefulness to that in that humanity hasn't quite managed to pave over everything at the end. There are still little pockets of resistance. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I mean, you know, maybe the final point is that also I think that it's not incidental that. The episode starts out in 1947 and ends in 1993. You know, 
that it is making the point that these woods are still there and that this, yeah. this life form is still there. And and even by all of the growth and the explosion of of Atlantic City and the the you know suburbs of New Jersey and I mean New Jersey is famously the most densely populated yeah. state in, in the country that there are st- it, it's still there it's still there and also I mean you know the nice yeah. little um th- you know, the nice little through line in the episode that the father and son at the very beginning of the episode and the end of the episode are played by the same actors. Oh yeah. Oh, that's cute. And, you know, I keep saying the last thing to mention, but, but this really is the last thing to mention. Uh, I love the terrible blue screen effect when Mulder's calling from the casino. <laughs> it's like they said that it would be cheaper to do that than having location shooting in New Jersey, which, yeah, sure. But there weren't any other casinos around anywhere. No, I know in? you could or you don't. You can't even build a really cheap casino set. Like, yeah, it seemed very strange to uh, me, uh, but whatever. I mean, we we just got off of a recording for a DS9 episode that took place in a casino. They were able to make it. <laughs> Although that was a pretty... Uh, uh, you're talking about Bada Bing, Bada Bang, which we talked about a couple yeah. months ago. They, um, not to talk about DS9, but <laughs> they, they did blow a lot of money on that episode. Mm. It was very expensive. So okay. they could have done maybe like a Royale from TNG. Yeah. All right, let's talk about Shadows. It was weird watching this episode at first because I definitely re- recognize the actress playing Lauren Kite. And she is from my so-called life. She's Howley Lowenthal, who is the uh, father's business partner in the later half of the season. I'll take your word for it. I like my so-called life. Maybe we'll find out why <laughs> at some point. I Okay, so so I want to start off this conversation by saying that I was a little bit remiss in our conversation about Squeeze last week because I didn't mention who wrote Squeeze, and I'm going to mention it now because they also wrote Shadows. Okay. It is uh, Glenn Morgan and James Wong, a writing partner, uh, writing team who met in, in college, I think. And they were kind of instrumental in the the early part of the X-Files. You know, for example, like Vince Gilligan famously yes. worked on the X-Files kind of later on. He's not working on it right now. Um, and he went on a crate breaking bad, you know, was to, this to great acclaim. Like his first major gig or Vince Gilligan? I think so, yeah. Okay. But you'll you'll we'll find out about yeah, Vince yeah, Gilligan's yeah. influence on the X Files later. But yeah, so so Glenn Morgan and James Wong are, are sort of the celebrated, you know, writing duo that that sort of not defined the X Files, but but did write some of the best episodes of the first couple seasons. They and I I say that mostly because I'm not really sure why they're so celebrated. If you look at the list of episodes that they wrote for the X-Files, they didn't actually write that many. They wrote, I think, four or five episodes in the first season. I think they wrote four or five episodes in the second season. Then they got this deal, development deal from Fox to develop their own show, Space Above and Beyond, which you may have heard about. I have not. It it was a like uh, one season sci-fi space show that... I watched when it was on. I haven't seen it since I was a teenager in 1995 or whenever it was on, 1996. Mm. Uh, it's not available anywhere. I don't think it was ever put on DVD, or if it is, it's out of print now. But it's kind of one of these like cult shows. Really? Yeah, that, that okay. I mean, I'm surprised you don't know about no. it. No. But so they. they Although it, it's one of those I would either completely know it or I have no idea, I guess, right. Zoom shows. I mean, the only reason I know about it is because yeah. I watched it when it was on when I was like 14. But yeah, and so they, they weren't writing for the X Files in the third season because they were off, you know, show running yeah. and writing their show. And then it got canceled and they came back and wrote a few episodes for, for the fourth season of the X Files. So they did like legit write. I mean, if you look at the list of episodes, there's they also wrote an episode that's coming up next week called Ice, that um, which is really good. Is that um, it's a little strange that they're so celebrated only because they didn't write that many episodes yeah. of the show. And, you know, some of the episodes they wrote, frankly, are pretty weak. Whoa. So, like, if you look at the whole show and say, I mean, I think there were like 200 episodes of yeah, the X Files. Yeah, yeah. They wrote, like, you know, lo- like less than, I don't know, like 4%. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's a little strange. But anyway, I just wanted to mention okay. that because. Because they seem like night and day episodes. Again, I know you like to squeeze a lot more, but. This one, again, I felt was so much more focused. Again, it was about something. I liked the characters. Even It does still end on a note of we don't exactly know what happened. We can't really figure out the nature exactly of – but in a way which I found – I understood kind of the powers of whatever entity they're facing in this. And, I mean, part of it is 
you know, I, I, I think uh, Lauren Kite is a much more interesting character than Eugene Toomes, for example. And I think all of the things that uh, the ghost of Howard Graves or whatever you want to call it does make a little more, are li- a lot less random than just I'm going to kill all anybody I can get my hands on. And yeah, eat their sure. livers because that's what my powers are. Sure, sure. I mean, I, I think that Shadows is an interesting episode as well. I mean, for a couple of reasons. It's so, as I understand it, because um, I like to do a little bit of research before we actually do these podcasts. It, you know, uh, uh, Morgan and Wong wrote this episode because Fox said they wanted like a paranormal episode. Yeah. And I think that. Well, it says paranormal activity in the credits at one point. <laughs> right. I, I, I think that it's it's kind of um, indicative of the fact that the X-Files is really sort of like, you know, they, they it was a bubble show. It was a new show. Yeah. Like, I don't think any of these episodes had actually aired at the point that they were, uh, you know, making these episodes, you know, because they usually do like six or eight episodes before yeah. they actually go and get on the air. So. The, they, they didn't have the the creative staff, Chris Carter in particular, did not have the cachet and the power that they would have later on to to not ignore the studio or, or the yeah. network, but sort of like. Go okay, guys. That's a nice idea, but we're like a mass legit hit, so we know what we're doing. So yeah. we're not really going to listen to you as much. And so you know, Glenn Morgan actually said, or maybe it was James Wong, I forget which one, said that they wrote this episode essentially to placate the network. That the network said, "Hey, we want a paranormal ghost episode," and they were yeah. like, "All right, we'll do that." And they could have just written that, right? And they don't. Yeah, I like what, what they do is is something that expands the the palette of the show the, you know the 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 um storytelling of the show because the mystery of of what happened to Howard Graves the mystery of the ghost or whatever yeah. is not the point of the episode and no one really seems to be interested in solving it whatsoever well because of the uh, a lot of it does hinge around that title drop that Scully gives late in the episode uh she says this is an opportunity to solve a case that's tangible rather than chasing after shadows um at the the crime is not necessarily that there's a ghost around. It's that there is a place that is selling weapons parts to a terrorist group and that the guy who is in charge of this had people killed and is having – making attempts on the life of another employee who knows about it. That is an actual crime. That is the – Yeah. Those are the actual bad guys that Scully is interested in chasing after. At the end of the day, it doesn't – almost matter to anybody whether or not Howard Graves' ghost is around, but that they do figure out why he was killed, how he was killed, and who did it. Yeah, because, I mean, it's the the way that they get involved in in the, the yeah. mystery of the episode, I think, is, is kind of interesting as well, because, of course, you've got this, like, shadowy pair of yeah. NSA, CIA, yeah. whoever they are, uh, calling Lynn Mulder and Scully because they're sort of the quote unquote experts in this, which is interesting. Yeah. You know, suddenly there's a wrinkle in their terrorism case and they don't understand it. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, I think it's it's really really smart on the episode's part mm-hmm. to make Mulder's interest in the paranormal and the unexplained how the the real world crime gets uncovered. Yeah, you know, they would not have. They would not have gotten as far as they had gotten in their investigation if it wasn't for the ghost of Howard Graves. And the reason why they figure this out at all is because Mulder and Scully are sort of interested in this thing about the body who was, you know, they're still moving after death. And um, and again, even if they get they when they get to the end and they're they finally get enough evidence to search the place, which we assume these two would have got into eventually they would have found nothing what without for the intervention of the ghost right so, right yeah it's it has some weird wrinkles at the end but uh, again if scully is trying to find the thing that she can bring to other people she can't say well there was a ghost who was uh, you know the founder was murdered and his ghost helped us find this no uh we ended up using a you know one of the secretaries was a whistleblower and she helped us find the evidence that to convict him yeah, yeah. And you know it's it's funny too because I think that the the episode is definitely more interested in uh Lauren Graves as a character. Well, not Lauren. Her name the last name is not Lauren Graves. Kite. Lauren Kite as a character and also this this plot line about the Isfaha and the weapons yeah. and things like that. You know, the 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 guy um Robert Dorland who's the 
you know, co-runner yeah. of the company is, is like legit creepy. And, you know, he also does try and like grab her and who knows <laughs> what the fuck is going to happen. He tries to have her murdered. Gra- Number one, he symbolically calls her his niece and then tries to grope her. <laughs> That's the weirdest part. Well, I don't think he tries to grope her. He grabs her. I don't, it seems a little, it, it, it's, it, it I mean, well, regardless. Yeah, exactly. You know, the, it's not the amount cool. of sexual menace in there is up for interpretation, but yeah. it's it's. <laughs> but I think that you know it, we like that he's punished in the end. Yes, yes, That's, absolutely. But you know, but Morgan and Wong writing this episode with this idea of doing a paranormal ghost story, and you know, the episode's not really super interested in that. You yeah, know, it, it, it's very much a character study of this character, Lauren Kite. It's it's much more interested, I think, in the you know terrorist stuff than it is about the ghost as well. And you know the ghost is really. I think that if you know the, this is something the X Files you know might do a little later, but I think if the the show this feels like a very pivotal show or episode for the for the show because I I think that you could see a version of this episode which did not feature the ghost at all, which yeah. did not feature the paranormal at all, which was just a straight up. You know, terrorist investigation where Mulder and Scully get get called in yeah. to help out for some reason, and it really could have taken the show in an entirely different direction. You know, but it doesn't. I think it's it's this really cements the show in some ways as a show which is going to have real life, uh, uh, you know, questions yeah. and and deal with the real world, but also have a paranormal aspect to it as well. Well, it's like I said, the show definitely does want to entertain and. Again, I feel like we'll get into this a, a, a lot, but this was a time when people were really interested in paranormal shit, whether that was psychics and ghosts or aliens and urban legends. Again, all of this stuff was re- – everybody was really interested in this, and so the paranormal plot becomes the MacGuffin for – the plot that's about the actual evil that's going on in the right. world. Again, you know, we you – know, you, our, our our faith in supernatural stuff notwithstanding, we all know that there is no such thing as ghost. There are such thing as weapon manufacturers who decide to sell to terrorists for a very nice profit. And at the end of the day, which is the one that we want to come up from the show being afraid of? The weapons manufacturers. I mean, I, I, I think it is very indicative of it being 1993 that – the corporation is unquestionably the bad guy, and the whistleblower is unquestionably the good guy. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think as too, we said, the show is a little naive at times. Yeah. <laughs> sure, I mean, you know, it was 1993. Yeah, I, I do think it's it's interesting though that that both in the Jersey Devil and and Shadows, the unexplained paranormal aspect of of these uh, episodes are not really the the bad guys, right? I mean, like, yeah, the the bad guy, quote unquote, in the Jersey Devil is the the police chief and you know the government of Atlantic City, and you know the bad guy in Shadows is you know this the guy who runs the company, yeah. and the company who's selling weapons to terrorists. I mean, humans are the real monsters. Again, maybe a cliche theme, but one that I think the show is going to enjoy revisiting a lot and i i guess yeah absolutely and i also guess i would just ask you to keep that in mind as we get deeper into the the alien conspiracy yeah. stuff as well because you know that is definitely going to be a part of it as well and again i think that you know lauren kite as a character in the episode i think she probably has the most screen time of anybody yeah. you know you really root for her you want her to be yeah. okay and I think it was a really smart decision on on uh, the writer's part to have her uh, be protected by the ghost. I mean, the yeah. ghost is not really a menace. I mean, certainly, a- a- at least in the first 20 or 30 minutes of the episode, we don't really know what's yeah. going on. But as it becomes clear that that the ghost of Howard Graves and, you know, let's be frank, I mean, nobody really seems to, to come to any conclusions about what it is. But that's, yeah. that's what it is. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not Scully, so I'm just going to go with the, what the show tells yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? But it, it, he's he's protecting her. I mean, he's, yeah. he seems menacing early on, but I, absolutely he is not in any way, shape, or form menacing. We don't worry about Lauren Kite after a while. And, for example, the scene when they, the two terrorists or hitmen or whatever are attacking her in the house, we worry very vaguely for them because they're about to die badly, but not that much. And we don't worry at all about Scully and Mulder when they're coming in. No, no, no. You know, no. So, so yeah, we don't worry for any of the good characters. And, again, the only moment when it looks like things are going to get out of hand is the office scene when he's about to choke Robert, what's-his-name, and they say, no, you know, don't do that, help us, you know. And 
uh, again, the the ghost isn't vengeful. It's looking for ju- it's a, it's a it's a tangible force of justice in a way. Yeah. And again, talk about good effects. I didn't like Squeeze's effects, but the hurricane in the office that was amazing. I mean the the visuals in this episode were really well done. Very, it was a very creepy episode. Yeah, they do a good job of of kind of you know intimating where the ghost is and what the yeah. ghost is doing. I mean, obviously, it was a lot of work to do that with fans yes. and things like that, but. You know, they, they it, it worked well. It works well, and I, I, you know, the the thing about this episode in particular for me is that I, I one of the things about the X Files so far, I think you're noticing, or maybe you're not, I don't know, is that it, it's a very lonely show. Like it really is about mm. sort of you know these unexplained mysteries that um, are are just a lot of these characters lead very very lonely yeah. lives, and you know, Lauren Kite, we don't get a good sense of who Howard Graves was as a person necessarily, although that's not really the point of the episode. Yeah. I, I don't know that we really get a good sense of who Lauren Kite is as a person, but I think that it doesn't really matter so much because what, what matters is what's happening to her now. And, you know, you, you intimate or you figure out that yeah. the show implies that Howard Graves told her what was going on. Yeah. I mean, we're told that she, they... she knows that um, the guy had Howard murdered. Yeah. It's a case where, again, you have a woman who was very estranged from a family and a man whose daughter had died and the two of them find a replacement for their missing thing in each other and ha- you know the two of them do become very cl- I mean there is that one scene where she is talking about him crying over the balance sheets and realizing that he can't uh take care of his employees and I, I think for when we hear Robert talk about oh this place is one family it's terrifying but that was probably the kind of thing that Howard said and felt very genuinely and whether he did, he did, yes, he did something reprehensible. He let the devil in, but for the best of reasons that he wanted to take care of the people that he wanted that were under his care. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and again, if 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 there is, if he does something that we would consider beyond the pale, it's for he does the wrong thing for the right reasons. And so I think that's the impression that we are getting with uh, Howard Graves. Yes, he may be murdering the anybody who's besetting themselves against Lauren Kite when he could do something else, but he is doing that out of love and protection and they were trying to kill her. So <laughs> you know, you know, it, it, it is an ambiguous situation, but again Howard Graves is dead. They can't do it. He, I, I, in that amazing scene with the coroner, he's dead or then dead. Like I she was great, but um Yeah, the direction is pretty good. Yeah. This um Howard Graves cannot be punished or judged for his what he may or may not have done. It's be, it's be, he's beyond earthly justice right now. But Robert is not, and the goal begins. How do we get? You know, that's where we can actually find justice. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's I, I think it's interesting because I'm glad you mentioned the the coroner because yeah, that shot is great with her, you know, face taking up <laughs> the entire frame and, and she's just over them. bored and you know amused. But she does. I think represent what the what Mulder and Scully specifically are fighting against, mm. which which is you know sort of complacency and uh, intellectual laziness. You know, yeah. they you know Mul- uh, Scully asks, well, how do you know it was it was him? And she says, well, it said so on the toe tag. You know, like and and that's not really an answer, right? No. I mean, they say, okay, well, who made? Then they're still. At this point, they're still suspecting Lauren Kite yes. of something. They don't know exactly what what's going on with her. So when they find out that Lauren Kite is the one that made the uh, you know positive identification of the body, they think that yeah. he faked his own death. Well, and, again, Scully in her report is saying how the accomplice who they think could you know obviously it, it, it's going to be, and they're still looking for the earthly reason behind this. That Howard Graves' ghost is around is nobody nobody would ever believe that, but. Even if it's the most outlandish thing ever, she can sell. Well, he managed to kill a vagrant and dressed him up as himself, <laughs> and, you know, like it would be that kind of a story. But it it's something that she could sell to a jury. And also, Mulder believes Scully. Yeah, I, mean, I think that that's a nice moment too. That part part of what I think part of the charm of the X Files for me is always that it's really fun to just watch these characters, and it's yeah. really fun to watch these characters figure out what's going on, yeah, and and watch them in the investigation mode. And that is interesting to me because that's really the first time where Mulder is saying, yeah, okay, Scully. Like, I think that the non, 
you know, yeah. the non-paranormal explanation might be the correct one. And she's shocked. Yeah, but he's also at, he's also turning around on her and saying, well, you always tell me I need to prove this. So you need to prove that, you know, he faked his own death in a way from Mulder the earthly reason is the thing that he has to make the leap of faith that right. it can happen so yeah it is a very nice reversal of that relationship and even further that goes when they're questioning lauren kite and uh scully is the one who comes up to him and up who actually goes to her and she's saying you know don't run away from him this is your opportunity to set things right if he's there then what you know his goal is going to be to expose this so we need to i and Mulder immediately you know is saying like i'm i'm surprised you're the one who's you're not the one who believes or something like right. that and she does say it as well i know that she believes and we definitely you know have the same goal in mind at this point so whether it's because she's doing it for Howard's ghost, for Howard's memory, for herself, that doesn't really matter. Scully is just pointing her in the direction. And yet, I don't know, number one, the fact that you very deliberately said that that wasn't Scully's sister kind of raised a little alarm for me. We don't know what uh, Scully's family situation is, and I wonder then if this is suggesting that perhaps Scully had lost a family member and does have a Scully has unfinished business with somebody. It's 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 unresolved issues with somebody. It is coming clear in that uh, conversation to me. Yeah, I think that. I mean, uh, we do meet Scully's family at, at some yeah. point. We meet Mulder's family at some point as well. Um, at least you know he doesn't have any siblings that are around, but he, he yeah. has you know parents and things like that. So you know we meet those people. So certainly we'll find yeah. out more about their their history. I think that you know for for me what what is kind of interesting in these in these two episodes specifically is that you know it's it's really shut down in the idea that um, Mulder and Scully are going to have a personal life in terms of friends yeah. or romantic relationships outside yeah. of um, their relationship. And I'm not saying it's going to be romantic or their friends or whatever, no. but I'm just saying that they don't really have a personal life. And the only personal life they're going to be allowed to have is through their family is through the history that they have. Yeah. So it, it really, it's going to become a very, very intense relationship between the two of them. Well, you know, again, we, we've seen glimpses of people who are dealing with this. We saw, uh, was it Darlene in conduit? We've seen, mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing Lauren kite now. Um, it's very clear that people who have had brushes with something from the X-Files, either p other people don't believe them or think they're, you know, insane or whatever, or they have, you know, they're, they're, they're too scared to talk about it to other people. But either way, all of these people are leading lonely existences. Uh, Lauren Kite is somebody who moves to Omaha to take a secretarial job just to get out of the situation she it's dealing with whatever you're going to call it supernatural paranormal does make one lonely and you're i'm getting hints of what Mulder's life might have been before he met up with scully and yeah. well i mean for example i think it was it in the Jer was it in jersey devil that that um I think it was Jersey Devil that uh, he was he was looking at the the oh yeah the porn, porn man. the porn man you know <laughs> and that that becomes kind of a thing you know I, just to say that Mulder is is viewed a little bit of a sexual creep let's say <laughs> um, well it was pre internet and really pre uh, two thousands porn revolution but well, the internet was around but you wouldn't necessarily want to download porn on a yeah you know, that's true um, fourteen four baud modem but e either way it's true that nineteen ninety three versus twenty sixteen pornography is a very different animal at this point in in history but uh yeah I mean the two of them I don't know if it necessary I don't get the sense that it's going to be one of the shows where the two of them are one character they are still I. I I'm seeing already that they are going to be separate entities, and sure. yet it is going to be the two of them against the world. Sure, sure. I mean, yeah, it definitely is going to be the two of them against the world, yeah. and that's that's very clear, I think. You know, the, I mean, the last thing I want to say about, about Shadows before we wrap this episode up, maybe, is that um, to, to go back to, to Scully's theory about Robert Graves, you know, faking his own death. Obviously, The X-Files is, is a show that sympathizes with and, and views Mulder's theories as correct quote unquote mostly yeah. because the show does not have a subjective point of view you know we we actually yeah. see tombs murdering people mm -hmm. we actually see tombs stretching and going into places that a human couldn't go into we yeah. see the jersey devil we you know and so 
we know that he's right yes, most this of the is time. He, Chris Carter as God can say, yes, you know, aliens exist, monsters exist, whatever the thing we're going to deal with, the nature may be different than what, you know, you may have originally assumed, but yes. Right. And and so, you know, and of course, Scully is is very incredulous about these theories because she is not, she does not, to use Mulder's phrase, she does not have her mind open to extreme possibility, right? And this, I think Shadows in that scene is really important for the development of their relationship because it, it is shown that Mulder is open to non-paranormal explanations yeah. when he thinks that they make the most sense. And yeah. that's what he does in this episode. And I think Scully is obviously taken aback by it and surprised, but... I think that actually is going to cement their relationship further. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's kind of, uh, they're listening to each other. This isn't a case where he's always convincing her, you know, uh, and you know, the two of them are recognizing that they complement and kind of need each other. They provide, it's not a case, again, it's not a case where they're completing each other. They're not exactly providing a missing piece. And yet between the two of them, they're able to attack, the, they, they're able to do a two-fronted attack yeah and again they're they're learning to coordinate yeah yeah well if you have any thoughts on either of the episodes of the x-files we just talked about the jersey devil and shadows please leave a comment on the post for this episode of the podcast at tuning in show.com you can check out our patreon at patreon.com slash truck about show patreon is a website where you can give us money every single month if you like our podcasts and want to support us with money we need money because Trump is coming for us. <laughs> you can do that. At and he didn't pay taxes for 19 years. So he's, <laughs> we, you know, we really need money. We really need money. You can do that at patreon.com slash truck about show, which also supports our other podcast truck about our other long running podcast. Uh, this week we are talking about dun, dun, dun star Trek Voyagers pilot caretaker. Ooh. We have finally gone into the, well, I was going to say like next to last, but that's not going to be true in a couple months because we're going to have Star Trek Discovery. We are. So that's exciting. And also it's a good time for Trek about, because what are we going to do about Star Trek Discovery? I don't know. We don't know. Do we really not know? I thought we discussed it. Well, we've discussed it. We just haven't come to any conclusions about what the fuck we're going to do about it. That's (laughs) true. We got to figure it out because it's coming on the air in a couple months. If you have any ideas, please comment on the post for anything. Yes. Or you could also send us an email, um, tuninginshow at gmail.com. We already told them that. No, we didn't. Oh, then tell them that. Yeah, I just did. I told you. We already told them that. Social media, we're on at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Tuning In Show is our username in all those places. And as always, please leave us an iTunes review for Tuning In. It is the best way for new fans to find the show. And as we go down this long, long journey through the X-Files, it's going to be a good time for new listeners to get into the show. Next week, we are going to be talking about uh, kind of a schizophrenic week next week, uh, Ghost in the Machine, which is legitimately terrible, but I like quite a bit because it's goofy as fuck. Okay. I can appreciate camp. (laughs) I'm glad you can. (laughs) And ice. Mac, why do you?